This is Getting to Know Your Bible, a program dedicated to the proclaiming of the good news of Jesus Christ. Here's Billy Lambert. A very dear friend of mine has tinnitus, that is, a ringing in the ear or in your head. I have that as well. And she and I joke sometimes. I told her one day, I said, you know, that ringing that we hear in our heads, well, that's aliens trying to contact us. And we laugh about that. Uh, just suppose there are aliens in space. Can you imagine their confusion if they were to come to earth and begin to see all of the different divisions in so-called Christianity that exists today? I have an idea they would be confused. But we want to talk about unity today. We're going to be talking not about division today. We want to talk about Jesus' prayer for unity. Please stay tuned. I'm Billy Lambert, and I want to thank you for tuning in today, especially if this is your first time to see Getting to Know Your Bible. We want you to uh, to avail yourself of an opportunity that we are making available today, and that's to receive a free Bible correspondence course. We have this program because we want to encourage people to study the Bible, getting to know your Bible. And so this Bible course will enable you to study the Bible on your own, at your own speed, in the privacy of your home that you might know more about the course, how you can study this course. Let's pause for just a moment. To help you in your study of the Bible, we want to send you this Bible Correspondence Course. This course is non-denominational. It's based on the Bible. It's conducted by mail, and it's free. To receive this course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama, 36580 or call toll-free 1-877-711-5214. The 17th chapter of John's Gospel is a prayer of our Lord. He's talking to His Father in heaven. I'd like to read just two passages from that prayer, from John chapter 17. And those verses are John 17, verse 20 and 21. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one. As thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that Thou hast sent me. When we think about the religious world as it exists today, especially as we think about what we sometimes refer to as Christendom, those who are followers and believers in the Lord Jesus Christ, we would all have to agree and admit that there's a great deal of division in that realm. Is that of concern to Jesus? When Jesus prayed, His concern was for unity of believers. Jesus said, listen to Him again, that they all may be one, as you are in me and I am in you, Father, that they may be one in us. Why do you suppose Jesus prayed for unity? Well, I think one of the reasons that Jesus prayed from, for, for unity from, and we learn it from verse 21, is so that the world may believe. Listen again. That the world may believe that thou sent me. Jesus said, I want my followers to be united, and that unity can cause other people who are unbelievers to believe 
that you sent me. I've often thought that, that the religious division that exists in our world today with so many different churches is a contributing factor to cause people to not believe. I've actually had many people over my years of preaching to tell me or say this to me, I just don't know what to believe. And so as a result of not knowing what to believe, with so many different ideas floating around, they just choose to go in the other direction. I believe Jesus wanted us to be united so that the world might believe. Also, I think another reason that Jesus prayed for unity is because unity glorifies God. In Romans 15 and 6, there Paul wrote that with one mind and one mouth, you may glorify God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Unity glorifies God. It, it causes people to focus their attention upon God. And it unity gives God the glory and the praise that He deserves. I think another reason that Jesus prayed for unity is because of God's attitude toward division. You know, in Proverbs, the sixth chapter, He talked about the seven things that are an abomination to God. One of those things that was an abomination to God are those that sow discord, that is division, among brethren. God does not like division. I think a fourth reason I want to suggest that Jesus prayed for unity because unity is good for us. Now, I want to read a passage to you from the Old Testament, some Psalms 133 and verse number 1. Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. You know, there are some things that are good that are not pleasant. There are some things that are pleasant that are not good. But, but we hear, learn here in this passage that it is both good and pleasant when there's unity among believers. I think I've given you four good reasons that Jesus prayed for unity. But when Jesus prayed for unity, for what kind of unity did Jesus pray? Well, notice the verses again. And in these verses we learn that Jesus prayed for the same kind of unity that existed between He and the Father. Notice it. Verse 20. Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. There's unity between the Father and the Son. And Jesus prayed that we would be one and have the same kind of unity that exists between He and the Father. Well, what, in what are they united? Well, they're united in mind. They think alike. They are united in their nature. They are both spirit beings, and they are eternal in nature. They are, they are one in their message. Can, can you imagine the Father teaching one thing on a particular subject, and then the Son teaches something else on that same subject that contradicts what the Father teaches? There would not be unity between Father and the Son. There would be division. They were one in their message. And they were one in their purpose. Their purpose was the salvation of the human family. When Paul, when Jesus prayed for unity, He prayed for the kind of unity that exists between He and the Father. 
He also prayed for the kind of unity that Paul wrote about in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and verse number 10. There he said, Now I beseech your brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that, that you all speak the same things, and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. You see, Paul is talking about unity of authority. Unity of authority. He said, whatever you do, you do it and in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I am beseeching you in the name or by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3, 17, the Bible there tells us that whatever we do in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's, that's unity in authority. Where do we get our authority? Not from an individual. We get authority from Jesus Christ, the Savior of the world, who is Lord over all. There is unity in mind. Paul said, we, Paul said that you be of the same mind, same thinking. And the, he said be in the same judgment. You know, there's some things that fall into the realm of judgment or opinion or they are expedients. And even in the realm where there are certain things that are of opinion, there should be no division over those things. It's not a doctrinal thing. Let me give you an illustration. It is my opinion that it is good to have a baptistry in your church building where you would, and you would use that baptistry for baptizing people. Now the Lord said baptize, but the Lord didn't tell us where to go do that baptizing. I've baptized people in spas, I've baptized people in swimming pools. I've baptized people in, in the ocean. I've baptized people in, in creeks. Y you see, the where is immaterial. What you're doing is a thing that's important. But it's my opinion, it's my judgment, that it's much better to have a, a baptistry in your building to do that. I remember one cold January morning, Someone called me and they said, uh, would you be willing to baptize someone today? I said, well, I, I would, I'd talk to them and see why they want to do it and so forth and so on. And, and they told me where the man lived and he lived out in the rural area. And for some reason, I went over to the church building to where they had the baptistry and I got those waders or the boots that you wear when you baptize someone. Put them in the trunk of my car. I go to see this man, and I begin to ask him some questions. He gives all good answers, the right answers, biblical answers. I, I said, he said, I just want you to baptize me for the remission of my sins. I said, well, well why don't you get in the car with me, and I'll, we'll drive up to the church building, and I'll baptize you there. He said, no, I want to be baptized like the eunuch. I said, well... Uh, we, we can just, I said, the water's warm. And he said, no, that doesn't bother me. I take a, a cold shower every day. He said, I want to be baptized in my pond. I knew then why I put the waders in the back of my car. So we drive down to Mr. Reed's pond. And I told someone that I tried to simulate the conversion of the eunuch as nearly as I could. You know, it says that they were riding along in the eunuch's chariot. And he said, here's water. I said, we're riding along through Mr. Uh, his cow pasture. And I turned to him and I said, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? He said, I know he is. Yes, I believe. I said, then I brought my car to a halt. We went down into the cow pond, both Mr. Reed and I, and we drove the cows out of the pond and I baptized him. You see, the, the, it's just my opinion Rather than doing that kind of a baptizing, it's better in the church building. But when we, in a, matters of judgment and matters of opinion, there ought to be unity. Never divide over things like that. Paul said, be of the same mind. Then he said, you need to speak the same things. You have unity in your message. Unity in message. I've often wondered 
why we could have the same Bible, believe in the same God, believe in the same Jesus, believe in the same Holy Spirit that inspired the writing of this book we call the Bible, the New Testament for us in this Christian age, and we cannot speak the same thing. Why is that? Well, one of the reasons is because we interject our own ideas, our own opinions. You see, the Bible teaches that we are to have unity. Now, we need the same kind of unity that Amos talked about in Amos, the third chapter, in verse 3. Listen to it. Can two walk together except they be agreed? Suppose you and I decided, now we're going to start walking together. And, and we're going to get up every day, and we're going to get some exercise. Now, there are certain things upon which you're going to have to agree if you're going to do that. Number one, you're going to have to agree upon the day that you're going to walk. You've got to have unity there. You're going to have to agree where you're going to start walking. If you don't agree on that, there's no unity. You're not walking together. Third, you're going to have to decide the direction you're going to walk. You'd have to be agreed on that. Number four, you're going to have to decide on the speed that you will walk. Now, if I decide I'm going to walk about one and a half miles an hour and you're going to walk four miles an hour, we're not going to be walking together. So you have to have agreement there. And then next, you're going to have to decide and agree upon how long you're walking. If we come to agreement on all of those things, it can be said we're walking together or we have unity. Jesus prayed for unity of those who are His followers. And Jesus wants us today to walk together. Someone says, well, is that possible today? Is it possible? Well, I don't believe God ever commanded something that is impossible to you. If Jesus prayed for unity, then it's in the realm of possibility, not impossibility. You know, God is not the author of confusion, but of peace. So evidently, unity is a possibility. The Bible teaches in Ephesians 4, 3 and to verse 6, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body, one Spirit, even as you're called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God, who is Father of all, through you all, and above you all. You see, Paul wrote about unity. Those are the seven pillars in the temple of unity. Someone says what? Well, if that's the case, Billy, how in the world can we walk together and be agreed? How, how is it that we can have unity? Well, sometimes people say something like, I've had this said to me, and maybe you've thought it yourself. That's not possible. We all are different today. We're all, we all see things in a different light. We all uh, come from different backgrounds. Sometimes th those backgrounds are ethnic backgrounds, and sometimes they're religious backgrounds, and, and sometimes they're geographical backgrounds that, that sort of mold our thinking and our attitudes. So we're all different. So how is it possible that we could have unity and see things alike in the religious realm? Well, let's just think about that for a moment. Can we see things alike in any realm? Is there anything in life in which we have unity, that is, we are agreed on certain principles in those realms? Th think about the realm of music. Now, my, my parents tried to make a, a musician out of me early on, but I'd rather play football, you see, and so that, that's really not a part of me, but I learned a few things. And I learned the notes in music. I learned that every piece of music uses those same notes. Suppose you, you have a child and they're taking piano lessons wherever you might live, and, 
Uh, just suppose you're living in California and you, you've, you, you've had your child taken there. They're all just making such a great progress with those lessons. And then you get a transfer and you've got to move to another part of the country. Let, let's just say that you're going to have to move to, oh, let's just say Mississippi. That's, that's where you job. So when you get located there in another state, you want your child to continue taking those lessons, learning how to play the piano. Now, you get a teacher, and after the very first lesson, suppose your child comes home and says, you know, that, that, that teacher I had in, in California was wrong. The teacher here in Mississippi is teaching a different note than, and notes than, than the teacher that I had in California. There, there, it's all different. You know there's something wrong. Because in the realm of music, whether we like classical music, country music, whatever kind of music we might like, there are certain notes that are used in all music. Now, I'm more accustomed to church music, and I, I know a little bit about the notes in, in our hymns that we sing in, in worship. But, but you see, there's unity there. We, we can have unity in, when you build a building. I, I remember when I was just a freshman in college that I, I told some of the upperclassmen, I said, you know, this summer we need to get out and hey, we need to evangelize somewhere. I said, let's pick out a county in the state of Alabama where there's not a church of Christ. Let's go there. Well, we found a county, and there was not a church of Christ there. And we, we, we borrowed a tent. And we set that tent up in this little country town. For three weeks we stayed there, knocked on every door in that county. And there was a preacher from town who came to us and said, Boys, if you want to make any progress... You're going to have to get out of town because the people of this town aren't concerned about any kind of religion. And we, all, we, we almost came to that same conclusion. So we began to look for a place if we wanted to come back the next year where we'd put our tent. And let me tell you what we found in our exploration. We went down a little dirt road. And at the end of that dirt road, there were two church buildings. One on that side of the road, one on that side of the road. Now, it was just obvious to the eye that those buildings were just exactly alike. I mean, it was uncanny. Different churches bearing different names, but the buildings were identical. Almost to the T, they were identical. And I wondered about that. I wondered, now, how could they have two buildings that close together, one on this side of this dirt road, one on that side of the dirt road, and they're almost identical? Somebody used somebody's plans, didn't they? You see, suppose I, that I live on the Gulf Coast of Alabama, and suppose someone said, we, we want to build a huge stadium. We want to build a coliseum on the Gulf Coast. And we want to build one like they have in New Orleans. Well, how could they duplicate that when they have in New Orleans on the Gulf Coast of Alabama? Well, they would have to find that architect. They would have to find all of the engineers and everybody that was involved in the building of that dome. And if they followed the, the plans that they used there, they could duplicate that anywhere in the world. But they'd have to go by the same plans. And when we follow the Bible without interjecting our opinions, without interjecting how I feel about it, how, when, by, by interjecting my own personal thoughts into it, and just follow the Bible as it is written, without trying to make it mean what I want it to mean, we'll all speak the same thing. Does that make sense to you? I've often thought if I, if I wanted to mail a, a a package. And I live in a little town called Somerdale, Alabama. It's just a little country town. I remember welcoming a man to town one day. I said, welcome to Mayberry. I think he understood what I meant. It's that small. And I suppose I wanted to mail a, a package in Somerdale. And let's just suppose that I, I go in, I give the man the package, 
And he said, that's going to cost you $5.28. Suppose I think, well, now he's overcharging me. I don't really think it would cost $5.28 to mail that package. So I say, well, I thank you, and I I'll, I'll may come back after a while. So I take my package with me, I get back in the car, and I drive up to a little town called Robertsdale. I go in the post office at Robertsdale, Alabama. I said, I'd like to mail this package. Could you tell me how much it would cost to mail? They said, $5.28. I'm not concerned with that. I, I, so I, I say, uh, I thank you. And I drive down to a town called Foley, Alabama, not far away. And I go in there and they weigh the package. I said, how much is it going to cost? $5.28. Could I ask you a question? Why would I get the same answer wherever I went? Well, he says it's because in the post office they have a, a scale, they have a rules to go by, they have a standard to go by, and, and, and the, the package, is, if it weighs a certain amount, then everybody's going to give you the same answer. I got the same answer three times. You see, the standard you go by is what will unify us. I've often said that it's not what the Bible says that divides us. It's what it doesn't say. We just need to follow the Bible. Unity doesn't come for a confederation of rams. It comes by following the shepherd. Would you follow Jesus by believing on Him, by repenting of your sins and confessing faith in Him and by being baptized? I want to thank you for watching today. Until we meet again, may the Lord bless you and keep you is my prayer. We want to help you as much as possible in your search for a personal relationship with God. You can now easily access our free Bible correspondence course online at gettingtoknowyourbible.com. If there's any way we can help you grow closer to God, please email us at gettingtoknowyourbible at yahoo.com or call us anytime at 1-877-711-5214. Getting to Know Your Bible has been presented by Churches of Christ. If you have a question about the church, or if you would like the location of a Church of Christ near you, or to receive the free Bible course, write to Getting to Know Your Bible, P.O. Box 314, Summerdale, Alabama 36580, or call 1-877-711-5214. Join us next time for Getting to Know Your Bible.